to understand the Synod of Oxford, of which uh, took place two weeks after Easter in 1222, we have to remember that uh, the Church of England and England was very much a part of Europe uh, at the time, and that in all issues pertaining to the laws of the church, the, the practices of the church, by the 13th century, by that time, England was really embedded in a European system. So when in 1215, there was a big ecumenical, that is, including the whole of Christianity, sort of council, uh, summoned by Innocent III, then Pope, to discuss everything and anything to do with the well-being of the church and going forward, uh, it was really quite remarkable that how quickly the, the decisions, 70 important canons that were decided and like listed, reached England, and then it was the job of locals to disseminate them throughout England, to make them the practice in England itself. So they didn't just publish it, uh, just copy and publish it. There was a bit of editing, you know, what suits, what does suit England. Now, um, of the 70 canons of this great council of 1215, known as the Fourth Lateran Council, uh, four of them um, mention Jews overtly. Uh, and uh, the one that has drawn most interest is the one about the Jewish badge. But in fact, there was also uh, there were also uh, guidelines about doing business with Jews, paying uh, interest to Jews, and um, what what how to treat Jewish converts. So all of this, in a way, had to be interpreted for the use of England. Now, there were a few really precocious uh, bishops who started disseminating this very early already, 1216, 1218. But what's really important about 1222 is that it's the first council summoned by the primate, that is the top ecclesiast of England at the time, Archbishop Langton, because he had been um, in exile for various reasons, you return in 1218, you get organized, because 1222 is his first really big comprehensive statement that could not be ignored. And so the canons of Oxford 1222 are an English interpretation, choosing, editing, some stuff doesn't apply, some does, but very, very much with the voice of Lateran IV for the use of the Church of England. And what's really striking is how quickly uh, bishops then disseminated it in their own diocese. You know, we've got Exeter and we've got London and we've got into a whole series of them. And the manuscripts show that obviously, uh, again, every bishop in a way was tailoring it to uh, his, his diocese. And we have, of the council itself, we have 60 surviving manuscripts, which is sort of massive from the age of manuscript and survival through the Reformation and everything. So this was a serious, from the point of view of the history of the church, it's a serious gathering, lots going on about all sorts of issues, very little of it about the Jews, but it includes includes the um, a, a number of important decisions about the Jews. One is always taken aback to find just how central the Jews are, given their tiny number compared to the European population. Why is it that so much preoccupation? Well, of course, the Jews are at the heart of the Christian story. It is something that has to be dealt with. It's a legacy. You can't kill them. You share you share scripture with them. They're part of the history of Christianity. They have to be around for the end of time as well. They have a role to play, you know, at the end of time. So the Jews are always there. They're a challenge. They're an irritant. And particularly for those uh, Christian leaders who in a way, have really, really big plans for an ever-increasing, every, ever-deepening Christian identity. And in a way, um, the 1215 Council and its offshoots in the various different countries of Europe is all about a sort of blueprint for a Christian society. It's about improving the clergy. It's about improving provision to the laity. It's about so many different issues. It's about going on crusades. It's about fighting against heresy. So amongst those perspectives, the Jews also play a part because if most of it is to say how Christians should live, there are also several canons that are about what do we do with those who don't fit in? You know, heretics, uh, inadequate priests, there's a whole, a whole, and, and the Jews fit into that, as it were, the bits that don't fit in and what do you do with them? And you have to be seen to be doing something with them, as it were. So that led to Lateran IV, to these uh, uh, four canons. And the one that interests us, I suppose, uh, most here is the one that was carried over into Oxford 1222. And that's the one about uh, 
the distinguishing garb or, or what we come to call the badge. So it begins with a preamble that says, you know, in our times, uh, and it's very interesting because when it's the, the papal council, the original, as it were, says Jews and Muslims end up being intimate with Christians. You can't tell them apart in many in many regions. We've got to do something about it. So they should wear a distinguishing sign. Of course, when it edit, was edited for England, the Muslims were written out. So it's obviously just Christians because Muslims were not perceived as a, as a massive reality in England at the time. And what's also very striking is the sort of design guidelines that are given. That is to say, it has to be of a color that contrasts the garb that's being worn. So you actually see it. It has to be of a particular si size. It has to be two fingers uh, how was it? two fingers across and four fingers two fingers in width, four fingers in height. That's right. So it has to be, you know, substantial in size, really noticeable. And whenever people go out and it says walking or riding a horse in town or country, they have to wear it. But what we also know is, and this is the really important thing, is that um, for all these attempts, and, and there was there were actually it's important to mention, I suppose, that also uh, there was um, also limitation on the um, construction of new synagogues. They should not, and also that uh, there should that Christians that Jews should not employ Christian servants. So it's this whole the issue of mixing, I suppose you might say, the mixing. Is, is is the badge and the not having contact by living in the same house, basically. So that's this issue of a mixing, the anxiety about the mixing of mutual influence and uh, the issue of not building that. Now, the important thing to remember here is that everything I've said so far is about how the church saw it. But in fact, the church had absolutely no authority over Jews in England. The, England, the Jews of England, as in many other places, were the property is maybe a bit of a crude word, but they were the business of the crown. They were part of the crown's treasury. Sometimes it was described servants of the crown. So they had absolutely no way of enforcing any of this. And, and in fact, we know from very early on already uh, in the 12, in as early as 1218, that clearly the right to not wear the badge was bought en masse as a privilege. So yet more income to the royal purse. So it's a very peculiar situation because on this issue, church and state were well separated, not on all issues, but on this issue, absolutely. And it was the same in France, it was the same in Castile, it was the same in uh, um, Hungary and Poland and other dynastic kingdoms in Europe. So it tells us about the state of mind of the legislators. It tells us the state of mind of the church, and that's not nothing. But on the other hand, in terms of daily interactions, it was an added irritant, but it was not something that we can compare to, I think, what people, most people will have in their minds when they hear a badge, which is, of course, something much more recent in the 20th century. Oh, it's almost like every country has to find its route through this, through this business. Um, there is a letter by a rabbi from Germany who's traveling in France in the 13th century, and he noticed, like, gosh, in France, in France, the Jews have to wear this, you know, whereas he, he, he like those of England, it was just not a deal. But what's nasty about having any form of restrictive legislation on the books is that it's there. <laughs> and in the future, if there is a situation, as there will be in the 1250s and 1260s, a good one and a half, two generations later, the will, I mean, remember, this is all happening while the king is a minor. Uh, it, it, he developed into, Henry III developed into a king that was very committed to his religion. And he particularly uh, vexed about Jews, and he was very proactive to make their life more difficult, to, to squeeze them for the money, but also to restrict, to encourage conversion. He set up um, what is now Chancery Lane. He set up in London, he set up um, a house, like a sort of, you know, a house, really a home, I suppose, an alternative home for, for Jewish converts to keep them safe in a Christian environment. There's a whole lot going on. So, so later on in the century, when uh, the situation is more um, uh, punitive, some, some legislation issued by the crown, in fact, apes those that were in the ecclesiastical legislation. Uh, and, and of course, 
the bishops of England are always serving the crown as crown counselors. I mean, the knowledge is there. This is a thing you can you can imagine. I mean, you're walking down the street just to wear this. Now, we have no absolutely no evidence this has ever really happened, but um, this becomes something that's now on the statute books that do affect the Jews. That is in royal legislation. The thing to remember is it got worse before it got better. That is to say there was an expulsion in 1290 from England. So uh, there was a deterioration and, and they became poor. They became poor because of the pressing and because of also increased limitation on the spheres of activity that they could um, um, benefit from, they could work in. Um, they lost, I mean, probably 1222 is just about the time when it was best to be a Jew in England, uh, you know, because they were already established and, and, and uh, they had connections, they, they understood the system, uh, and, and we have evidence of many very, very rich Jews. But by the later part of the century, partly because of the royal uh, um, legislation, partly uh, because of internal politics of England, there's a big uh, a movement in the 1260s against the crown. The barons re rebel in various ways that um, that mean that there's chaos, and when there's chaos, it's never good for minorities. Definitely not for Jews. And so, um, and twelve ninety, of course, is the expulsion. And of course, not to return until the time of Cromwell in the seventeenth century. And there again, you know, it's a process. And um, and and of course, one once on the seventeenth century, and it's not just a story of the Jews. There are, of course. Uh, uh, other Christians that aren't Anglican but are and, and not established to, to suffer persecution, let alone Catholics. So um, you know there is there is a, a, a growing type of uh, toleration that goes on, and and there are groups that were persecuted more more fiercely. But the question is, you know, how they fit in if they do not have. Um, I mean, nobody nobody is a citizen; they're subjects, obviously, at the time. But um, if um, the Jews cannot hold office, if the Jews uh, cannot, you know, they can't go to universities. So there are real strict restrictions that are only really mo removed in the 19th century. These anniversaries are good for concentrating the minds. It doesn't erase the past. And in a way, in what ways are we responsible for people 800 years ago and their decisions? But in as much as we are heirs, it's a legacy. It's a legacy that the church has to inhabit, Protestant or Catholic. Or I know a lot has changed in the church, but nonetheless, and I think that that's what's being recognized. But also, it seems to me the best way to recognize where we are and our commitment to learn is how we confront issues that are similar in our own society now and looking forward. It seems to me that's the only meaningful, true transformation. Uh, although it's it's nice to have a gathering like Sundays, and I'm sure it will it will mean a lot to people. But the real test is how we all our legacies, you know, of slavery, of misogyny, of social injustice. It's about we inform ourselves. What do we do about it now? Uh, and particularly people in positions of leadership, as so many of the people gathered on Sunday will be.